So we have a special guest tonight, Professor Che Wong Shu from Brown University from the United States, who is a leading expert in, expert in the world of very hard methods, such as uh, Wino, uh, discontinuous Galerkin, and some other schemes like spectral elements as well, with a lot of various applications, both in science and engineering. And he will be giving a, a sequence of presentations, three days, today, tomorrow, uh, here in Dolgobrudny, and on Monday is in Moscow, in uh, Tetakovska station. Uh, today we will be uh, devoted to weighted essentially non oscillatory schemes, we know, and two other days will be on discontinuous Galerkin methods. So we have three hours each time, with uh, two breaks in the middle. So, please. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction, and I'm very happy to be here, first time in Moscow. Uh, I will give these uh, uh, three uh, lectures each for three hours, so I hope to be pretty uh, uh, comprehensive, uh, trying to describe both the fundamental issues and some recent developments of a few uh, numerical methods. Today I will talk about Veno finite volume and finite difference schemes. Veno stands for weighted, essentially non oscillatory. And uh, tomorrow and on Monday, I will discuss uh, these continuous Galerkin methods. Because the solution 
can be discontinuous even if the initial condition is smooth. So uh, this uh, is well known. I'm not going to describe the theory leading to this thing. I'm, still, I'm assuming that most of you already know the PDE theory behind this kind of equations. Basically, it says that even if your initial condition is smooth, it's not enough to guarantee that you have smooth solutions for all time. You will have these continuous solutions. Then we would like to have schemes which are both high order accurate in smooth regions and essentially non oscillatory when you have shocks. When you have these continuities, you would like your solution to be uh, essentially non oscillatory. So these two things are sort of contradictory to each other, as you will see, and then how to use maintenance achieve them will be a computational challenge. It's a challenge to design schemes. Okay, now uh, starting from, let's say, linear schemes as an example, <coughs> if you have this conservation law, now I have further simplified the previous PDE. I'm assuming that f of u equals a constant a times u. So this is certainly a linear convection. Standard last window scheme, which is a second order accurate in space and time, can be written out explicitly for this equation in this form. So here lambda is delta t over delta x. And you can see that, first of all, you can check this scheme is stable only if you have this CFL condition, the absolute value of a times lambda is less than or equal to 1. Under this condition, you can easily see that at least one of the three, at least uh, actually exactly one of the three coefficients uh, will be negative. For example, if A is positive, if A here is positive, then the third coefficient is negative, because A is positive, you have a negative sign here, this factor is, because A number is less than Y, this is a positive number, so this is negative. If A on the other hand is negative, then this coefficient is so at any rate, you will have uh, three numbers, three coefficients, one of them being negative. So the three coefficients sum to one. If one of them is negative, then it is very easy to show that you do not have normal oscillatory properties. In other words, if all these three numbers are within a certain range, for example, if all three are positive, then you can cook up the examples for which this result will be negative. Yeah, just make this number, which has negative coefficient, a bit bigger, a little bit bigger, then you will end up with negative numbers. So this <coughs> means that the solution will be oscillatory, will go beyond the previous bound, will go up, overshoot, or below, undershoot. So this is the famous Gordonov theorem. You might say that, okay, you have this Gordonov theorem, uh, which uh, is for this scheme. Uh, how about if I design a different scheme? If you stay with linear schemes, this is a barrier. No matter how you design the scheme, you will either get only first order accuracy or you will have negative coefficients, so then you will have oscillatory results. If you go to nonlinear schemes, for example, if you go to Eno schemes, Reno schemes, and so on, so these are all nonlinear schemes, then you can get bias difficulty. So that's why we are considering nonlinear schemes from now on. Now, what is essentially non oscillatory uh, this concept? This uh, concept started with a uh, 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 paper by Hart and Enquist, the Ocean Akravasi Journal of Computational Physics, 1987. Uh, the finite difference version came out a couple of years, but well, one year, two years later, there are two papers on finite difference schemes, which we will describe what is the difference between the finite volume scheme here and the finite difference scheme here, but they both use you know, methodology. The idea is that you get a uniform polynomial interpolation or reconstruction, which I will describe next in some detail, uh, for the numerical fluxes. Or, uh, you can use polynomial or you can use other basic functions. Uh, the key here is that you have uniform high order, so in other words, uh, you never decrease the degree of the polynomial. You always use the same high order polynomial. However, you adaptively choose the stencil. So among several candidate stencils, one of them is chosen according to local smoothness. So this is sort of a concept which avoids the difficulty of simultaneous 
high order accuracy and the non oscillatory requirements by applying it to problems with isolated discontinuities by adaptively choosing the stencil. I think I have a, a picture here for the stencil. So you can see that if my target is to get some approximation at the location j plus half, this appro approximation could either be a reconstruction or an interpolation. I will explain later what is the difference. Uh, so you, if your data is stored at this solid point, so for example, point values or cell averages are stored at these locations, uh, if you build a polynomial of degree 2, so a second order quadratic polynomial using, let's say, these three points, which corresponds to stencil 1, then you can read the value at this location, so that is uh, one possible approximation. You can also build a quadratic polynomial using stencil 0, which are these three dots, and read it at this location, that corresponds to another quadratic polynomial, and by the same token, also a polynomial based upon these three points, based on stencil 2. So all these three polynomials are second-order uh, second polynomials, third-order accurate. Uh, typical strategy would be using only one of them. For example, the, the one corresponding to S1 is, will be the most reasonable because uh, it is sort of the closest to your target point. And you can see here that I deliberately have chosen the point, number of points, to be even, to be odd, sorry, so that you have one more point to one direction than the other. For example, this S1 has one more point to the left than to the right. This is for future applications in upwinding, which means I'm biasing certain side, I'm biasing the left to the right. So S1 is the most reasonable stencil if there is no other reason to choose otherwise. However, if your, your function is possibly discontinuous, then the situation changes somewhat. For example, you could imagine that there is a discontinuity between these two dots. There is a discontinuity of the function here. Then what happens is that stencil 3, stencil S2, is a bad stencil because it will cross this discontinuity right, to choose information. So probably you don't want to choose the polynomial corresponding to S2. Well, the polynomials corresponding to S1 and S0 are both good. On the other hand, if you have a discontinuity at this location, then S0 is no good, but S1 and S2 are both good. If it is here, this continuity is here, then maybe S0 and S1 are both not so good because they both cross the discontinuity, but S2 is a good one and so on. So you basically uh, say that uh, you, out of the three candidate stencils, maybe one or two of them are not so good, but at least one of them is good. So the idea of Eno is trying to have an adaptive way of choosing this stencil locally so that you always end up with a good stencil. So this is the idea of the original Eno scheme. Now, what is Weino with this actual word W? So it's Weino, weighted Eno schemes, it's actual word W. It stands for weighted essentially non cellular schemes. It's an extension of Eno schemes. We will explain what the extension is later. Uh, the third order version, uh, the third order final volume version came out in this paper by Liu, Osher, and Chen in Journal of Computational Physics, 1994. And then the fifth or the final difference and general framework for Weino schemes comes out in 1996 by a paper of Jiang and Xu. And this paper sets out the basic formulations of uh, Weino schemes that are used in most of applications. So most of the applications of Weino schemes uh, use the framework in this paper. Uh, the idea here is that in the previous picture that you have uh, uh, three stencils, your Eno schemes will try to pick one of them based on smoothness. So if you, all three of them are good, you pick one of them for some criteria. If one of them is bad, hopefully you pick one out of the remaining two. If two of them are bad, then you pick the one. You have no choice, just pick the one. The way now idea is to say I'm a little bit more greedy. 
I will not, not pick one of them. I will use all of them. So I have three candidates, I have three polynomials, I put three coefficients in front and I sum them up. Now this way I make a convex combination of all three polynomials. Of course, I still want to achieve the effect of Eno. In other words, I still want to avoid too much interpolation across these continuities. So that means if the first stencil is not a good one, it contains a discontinuity, I would hope that its coefficient, even if it may not be zero, I hope it is very small. So in other words, I essentially have not used that. Right? I hope that the, the choice of the coefficients would be smart enough so that basically it automatically avoids crossing these continuities. Even if it doesn't assign that polynomial a weight zero, it assigns it to a very small weight. So this is the idea. Uh, of course, then, the success of Windows schemes will be strongly related to your design of so-called nonlinear weights. How do you put these three coefficients in front? So this is the key idea. Okay. What are the advantages of this type of schemes? Uh, as I mentioned, the major advantage is that you try to obtain a uniformly high order approximation all over the place. The traditional idea of TBD schemes, like second order TBD schemes with based on limiters, is the following. You have a high order polynomial either interpolation or reconstruction everywhere. You then try to see if you are near this continuity. You, the high order polynomial is oscillatory, so what do you do? You try to limit it. So you try, for example, if it is a straight line, you try to just uh, change the slope of that straight line. You try to modify the polynomial. Once you modify the polynomial, it's very likely that you will lose accuracy. Right? You change the polynomial, you lose accuracy. The Eno idea is that I don't try to change the polynomial at all. I use the old polynomial. I just use out of many candidates one of them in a smart way. And the way now scheme is to say I use all three of them. I just sum them up in a smart way. So this, you can get the high order accuracy back. So this is a major advantage of <coughs> uniform high order accuracy, even when you have smooth extrema or other complicated smooth structure. And and the discontinuity, it achieves an effect which is similar to TVD schemes. From your own eyes, you will not be able to see oscillations. However, if you zoom in, in a computer, if you zoom, you, you, you choose that window, you zoom, you will see there are some small oscillations. So these are only essentially non-oscillatory. They are not really non-oscillatory. So this is uh, why the word is coming from is essentially non-oscillatory. It's quite robust for many physical systems with strong shocks. So this is one advantage I want to emphasize. Even though tomorrow and Monday I will discuss about DG schemes, even there I will describe some of the applications of Vino as a limiter for DG schemes. So in controlling strong oscillation, I mean for strong, uh, sorry, in controlling oscillations for strong shocks, Vino methodology is still more advanced than DG. So DG still relies on limiters, and one of the very robust limiters is still Vino based. So this is its very advantage. It's uh, because of these advantages, these type of schemes are especially suitable for simulating solutions strong, containing both strong uh, discontinuities and complicated smooth structures. A typical prototype example would be shock interaction with vortices. So you have a shock, which is a discontinuity, you have a vortex, which has a lot of complex smooth structure, and they hit each other, they interact, so you can see that both effects would be important to resolve. <coughs> okay, now you have talk, you are talking about two types of schemes. One is Eno, the other is Veno. What is the advantage of Veno over Eno? But the advantage is that you have one more letter. <laughs> oh, not really. Uh, a little bit more than that. Uh, the advantage is that, well, first of all, you actually get higher order accuracy for the same information. So, for example, in the previous picture, I have three stencils. I have five points. If I use Eno, out of the three stencils, I have chosen only one. 
So no matter which one I choose, I ended up with a quadratic polynomial, which is third order accurate. So order is three. Now, if I use Wayno, I used all three of them with suitable coefficients. If I choose the coefficients in a smart way, later we will see that then I can achieve the effect of the full five-point stencil, which is a polynomial of degree four, which is fifth order accurate. So I get from order three to order five, or from order r to order two r minus one for any integer r, which is a significant increase in the order of accuracy by using the same amount of information. So this is one major advantage of Wayno over Eno. Also, this advantage is probably less important as a matter of programming. So Eno has a lot of comparisons. If I'm bigger than you, I will choose you, and so on. So there are a lot of logical if sentences. Well, Wayno has a lot of algebraic computations, but no if sentences. Then it's an argument of which one is faster on computer, right? Depends. Maybe on today's GPU kind of environment, again, computation is fast, right? Computation is very fast, so, so this could be an advantage. This is also an advantage. The numerical flux function is smoother for Wayno than for Eno. So in other words, if you want to compute steady state problems and so on, then the steady state convergence is going to be faster. Okay, so now let me really talk about some basics uh, which is important to understand this uh, kind of uh, uh, procedure. Uh, I will explain two problems. The first problem is probably well known better known than the second problem, but of course if you are in this CFD business, probably you also know the second problem very well. The first problem is traditional interpolation, which says that if I have a collection of grid points ui equals to uxi, just consider grid values which are uniformly spaced, I have a uniformly spaced point by point xi, then I have the value of the function u at these points u sub i, then Let's say interpolation would be a problem of getting, say, using the three point values, getting a polynomial, quadratic polynomial, which goes through these three points. So, quadratic polynomial going through the three points, cubic polynomial going through a set of four points, and so on. So, the set of points that the polynomial would go through, this is called a stencil. So, you have a stencil consisting of certain number of points. The more points you put into the stencil, the higher order the polynomial you are looking for, more accurate the polynomial will be. So this is the standard interpolation problem. For example, what do you use this interpolating polynomial for? For example, you can read that polynomial at some points other than the node. You don't read it at the node because then you get the point ui back yourself, right? Because it's interpolating. But you can read it, for example, at x equals to xi plus half midpoint between two nodes, you can read the value there. So that's called interpolation. You could also, for example, read the derivative at some point, right? You have a polynomial interpolation, take the derivative, you can read the de derivative at any point, for example, at the node, x equals to xi. So these are standard problems in elementary numerical analysis, interpolation. And there is a very closely related problem called reconstruction, which is to say the given information is no longer the point values of the function u, u, ui equals to uxi, rather it is the cell average, it is the integral of ux over the cell xi minus half or xi plus half divided by the cell length. So this number u bar of i is the average of the function in the interval. So suppose I'm given the cell average of the function over every interval, then suppose I want to find a polynomial which, for example, the stencil is a collection of three cells. I want to find a quadratic polynomial whose cell average agrees with the given cell average in each of these three intervals. So three conditions, right? You take the cell average here, it agrees with u bar of i minus 1. Here, it agrees with u bar i. Here, it agrees with u bar i plus 1. Then three conditions, you can determine uniquely the polynomial. That is called the reconstruction polynomial. And then once you get the reconstruction polynomial, you can do many things to it. For example, you can read this reconstruction polynomial at i, I plus half. In other words, given all these cell averages, you can get 
the reconstructed polynomial, you can read the reconstruction polynomial at the i plus half, at the midpoint between, at the interface between two cells. So these two problems are very closely related. We will uh, concentrate our discussion on problem two. Uh, problem one is also very useful, for example, in solving Hamilton Jacobi equations, but Contrary to the common belief, both finite volume and finite difference actually rely on problem two. So you might think that for, for finite volume, certainly it will rely on problem two because finite volume schemes handle cell averages. But you might think that finite difference schemes, which handle point values, you should use problem one because you have point values. Shouldn't then you use interpolation? Actually, no. You, even for finite difference schemes, it is still strongly relying on problem two. So I will explain why this is the case. So problem two is more relevant to us. We concentrate our discussion on problem two. However, the same way of procedure can be designed for problem one in a similar way. Okay. So let me explain now how do you do a reconstruction. How do you do reconstruction? We know reconstruction. Okay, so first, let us say we try to build a polynomial Px which agrees with the given averages in a given stencil. So this is the first building block of we know. So just, you give me a stencil. I want to build a polynomial whose cell average in each cell in this stencil will agree with the cell averages you give me. For example, if you give me the sense of being i minus 1, i and i plus 1, in other words, you give me three numbers corresponding to u bar of i minus 1, u bar of i, u bar of i plus 1, so these are the cell averages, then I would want to find the second order polynomial p of x, which agrees with these three numbers in the following way. You can see that this px, this unknown function px, integrated in this cell, which is cell i minus 3 half to i minus half, divided by the cell length, should be equal to your given cell average. And same thing here for this cell, and same thing here for the third cell. So these are the three conditions that are put on p determining px. Three conditions, px is a second order polynomial, it should have three unknowns, so I should have a unique px, which does the job. As a matter of fact, I don't need, in many applications, for example, in writing down the finite volume scheme later, I don't need the Px per se, I don't need this polynomial. I only need the value of the polynomial at some given point, for example, at i plus half. This is because this value approximates to the value of u, the unknown function u, at the cell, at the cell boundary I, uh, at some i plus half. So I need p of x i plus half. Because of this, you don't even need to find p x. You can jump through the procedure of finding p x, and you can immediately write down the answer of p of i plus half, p of x i plus half, which is given by this. This is because the procedure is linear. The mapping from u bar i minus 1, u bar i, u bar i plus 1 is set to the value of p of x i plus half, this mapping is linear. So in other words, you have to have three constants whose combination gives you u of i plus half. You just find these three constants. There are many ways of finding them, and in my lecture notes, these uh, formulas are there, and also a big table is there for all kinds of stencils, all kinds of polynomial degrees, and these constants are there. So in practice, when you write a code, you just put these constants, put it there, save it, and then use it. You don't even care how they are derived. So this is, will save you a lot of time. So in other words, it is very easy. The reconstruction problem is very easy at the end. Basically, if you give me a stencil, you give me several cell averages, and you ask me to build a polynomial and read the polynomial at a certain point, i plus half, then I just pick out, out of the database these coefficients, I just multiply your given cell average by this coefficient, sum them up, I will get the value. So the computation is quite fast. 
So basically, you mean this is this sensor again, these three numbers, I can do I pass half by the same token. I can do the same thing. Uh, a, I can do the same thing for the other two sens sensors. For example, recall that this picture I sh have shown before, right? I have three sensors. I basically give you, I already described to you the formula to compute the polynomial based on this stencil S1. So I have these three guys. I multiply these three guys, the cell averages by suitable numbers, I can get the value here. By the same token, I can compute the polynomial corresponding to stencil S0 and to stencil S2. I would get two similar formulas. This formula was before, you have already seen. Right, corresponding to i minus 1, i and i plus 1 to get the u of i plus half. No, because I have three stencils, let me put the index here corresponding to the stencil S1, I put the 1 here. The stencil S0 contains i minus 2, i minus 1, and i, and you have three constants, this time three different constants, of course, you can check it from <coughs> the table in my lecture notes or from wherever, you find that these are the three constants. And with these num numbers, these constants times these three cell average, you get another approximation to use up i plus half. By the same token, the third tensor called S2, you have i, i plus 1, i plus 2. You find out that these are the three constants by multiplying to the suitable uh, cell averages gives you this value of approximation to the i plus 2, u sub i plus half. Now, you have three approximations to u sub i plus half coming from three different sensors. I denote them by u0, u1, and u2. Then what do you do with them? Well, for e node, you pick just one of them. But for v node, you use all of them. You use all of them. You make a linear combination Conversion combination of all these three numbers, and you end up with the final approximation, u sub i plus half. Now let me explain this linear combination in two steps. First, preliminarily, I choose this gamma 0, gamma 1, and gamma 2 as constants, which do not depend on uh, information of u. So these are called linear weights. This in the literature, weight of literature is called linear weights you find the constants gamma 0, gamma 1, and gamma 2 purely based on accuracy. So the question you pose is the following. If each one of these is third order accurate, because each one of them corresponds to three points, corresponds to a quadratic polynomial, so each one of them should be a third order approximation to the true value at i plus half, then the linear combination should be at least the third order, that's no problem. As long as the coefficient sum to one, each of them is the third order, of course the sum is the third order. But I want more. I want the final result to be fifth order accurate. So two more conditions. So then these constants cannot be chosen arbitrarily. And you can work out, it's a little bit of algebra, you work out that if you choose gamma zero equals one over 10, gamma one to be three over five, gamma two to be three over 10, then, this linear combination will give you u of i plus half to be fixed order accurate, so two order higher. So these linear weights are chosen this way, purely on accuracy. It does not consider oscillation or non-oscillation. So if you use this u of i plus half, then you don't gain non-oscillatory at all, because this would be the usual polynomial interpolation on the bigger tensor. So that's no use. However, it will be accurate. So now my job is to modify gamma 0, gamma 1, gamma 2, so that the final result will be accurate and non-oscillatory. It seems to be a task very difficult to achieve, because you see, what is non-oscillatory? Non-oscillatory means that if, let's say, if tensor 0, S0, contains a discontinuity, then I already said before, I hope the coefficients in front should be close to zero. I don't want to pick information from this stencil. However, the information, if you use gamma zero, it is one over 10, it is far from zero. So I would want my weight to go from one over 10 
to zero in the transition that if this stencil is good, I want to buy number 10. If this stencil is not good, I want to use something close to zero. So I want this to be automatically achieved. So you want to design formulas which achieves this effect automatically. So that's how you go to the next stage, which is called nonlinear weights. So nonlinear weights are denoted usually by W0, W1, W2, or maybe it's omega, <laughs> depending on <coughs> when you type latex, whether you use omega or use W. But these three numbers are chosen in the following way. So this is the condition, basically my requirement on these omegas. So I would want omega k to be roughly equal to gamma k if all three stencils are smooth. If my function is smooth in all three substencils, then I would require gamma k, omega k to be very close to gamma k. This is for accuracy considerations, right? Because if I use gamma k, I get fifth order. If I use omega k, I also want to get fifth order. Then you can use a little bit of mathematics. You will find out that as long as your omega k equals to gamma k plus all the data x squared, you will achieve your objective. In other words, if I replace gamma k by omega k, if my omega k satisfies this condition, then with omega k, I also get a fixed order accuracy. So that's nice, right? So this is one condition. The other condition is that if ux has a discontinuity in the substance of sk, then I would want omega k to be essentially zero. What do I mean by essentially zero? Well, in the formula I'm going to describe, or essentially zero means that it is delta x to a certain power. In this particular case, it is delta x to the power 4. So it is a quite small number. So you see this are transition of two requirements. And I mentioned that in this Jiang and Shu 1996 JCP paper, the formulas are given by this uh, simple recipe. So these are the formulas which are adopted by most uh, Wino applications and it's essentially used uh, uh, with some variations uh, recently but uh, basically these kind of things used in all Wino codes. So this is how you do it. First, you design something called a smoothness indicator called a beta k which measures the smoothness of the polynomial corresponding to this stencil. So you have three substencils, so you have three polynomials. You want to measure the relative smoothness of these three polynomials. If all of them are the same, if all of them are smooth, then hopefully all the beta k's are the same, same size. Then you can see that if all the beta k's are the same size, then all the omega k's with delta and normalized omega k's are proportional to gamma k. Right? If the bottom is a constant, then it's basically proportional to gamma k. And then you renormalize, you get gamma k back. So in other words, if all three beta k's are the same, then the omega k's you get nonlinear weights will equal to linear weights. So you get nice fixed order accuracy. However, on the other hand, if beta k, if one of the beta k is way bigger than the other two, Beta k, the bigger beta k means that it's less smooth. If one beta k is huge, the other two are reasonably small, then because it is sitting on the denominator, that corresponding omega k delta will be much smaller than the other two. Then when you nominalize so that they sum to one, then this smaller guy becomes delta x to a certain power. So this is the basic idea of using smoothness indicator to get a nonlinear weight to achieve the purpose that I described before. And this nonlinear indicator, of course, you can still have a lot of choices. How do you measure the smoothness of a certain function? This we tried. Jiang Guangxia Jiang was a PhD student by that time, so he tried many, many things. And then we finally picked this one based on the, com based on the balance, sort of, a, sort of a compromise between uh, between easiness of formulas and speed of formulas and performance, basically. There are some other formulas which actually perform slightly better, but more, much more expensive. For example, it involves exponential functions, which is very, very slow on computers. Some other things are less robust and so on, but this one seems to be the most robust and less expensive in a combination. So, okay. So this beta case, in one word, is just the L2 norm 
of the derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on, until you don't have any derivatives. For example, in this case, it is just a polynomial of degree 2. Each stencil has a polynomial of degree 2. Then you can only take two derivatives, because if you take the third derivative, it's already zero. So you take the derivative up to, you cannot take, in this case it's 2, you just integrate the square of it, sum it up. There are coefficients here to data to different powers. This is to ensure that this smoothness indicator doesn't depend on the mesh, doesn't depend on scaling. So this coefficients, this will be data x, this will be data x cubed, is to ensure that the final result does not depend on data x. Otherwise, it's just the square, just the L2 norm square, very simple, add up all derivatives. You might say, why do you add up all derivatives? Would, wouldn't it be enough just to use the first guy? Actually, Guangshan certainly tried that, it's not good enough. So there are, yeah, a lot of, I would not say theory, but a lot of experience built into such things. By the way, Guang Shan Jiang is no longer in this field. He is in Wall Street, <laughs> making money. <laughs> I asked him if he still remembers Wei Nao. Uh, yeah, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, he was a very good student, right, right, in this paper. OK. Now, uh, those, this is a beta case. But these are just how you derive them. At the end of the day, if you are programming them, you don't need to worry. You don't need to remember how these are derived. So if you are only assigned to program them, then these are the formulas. You can see that these formulas are extremely <coughs> simple, right? If you have the sum averages in each stencil, then you just do some algebra, quadratic evaluations, you get the smoothest indicators. You can see that these formulas do not depend on data x anymore. And this is exactly the reason that in the previous definition, we scaled the L2 norms of the first derivative and the second derivative. We scaled them in a similar way, in, in a suitable way, so that the final formulas are free of any data x, which should be the case because hyperbolic conservation laws are scaling invariant if you scale space and time in the same factor. So you hope your scheme would also have that property. So this is very nice. You can see, basically, these formulas plus the formulas I have given you before to compute contributions from each of the three stencils will be enough for you to write a window code. So the window code is not difficult to write. OK, so this is uh, basically the uh, uh, description of the very simple window reconstruction procedure. Uh, you can go the long way to derive what is rationale to compute this uh, coefficients of the reconstruction, the linear ways, the non-linear ways, smoothly indicated, and so on. Or you can go the easy way, namely you just care about the final results. So-called reconstruction is simply a set of constants for which you multiply to the cell averages, and then you read the value at i plus half. And uh, we know the nonlinear weights are just based on smoothness indicators, which also have formulas. And the linear weights, which also have numbers. So <laughs> if you have those, you can already, at the minimum, write the code correctly. OK, so let me spend a bit more time uh, before break to discuss our uh, finite volume weight of schemes for conservation laws. So once we have the weight of procedure, described before, to, it is very easy, it is essentially straightforward to describe a finite volume scheme. Finite volume scheme is that you have this conservation law, you simply integrate this conservation law in the cell i sub small i. So you integrate and you divide it by the interval length, you get this formula. The cell average, ddt of the cell average, plus 1 over delta xi of this f, evaluated at i plus half minus f evaluated at u i minus half is zero. This is not a scheme. It is a formula satisfied by the exact solution of PDE, of this PDE. So that's very nice, right? You have PDE, you have the integral form of the PDE, which, is this, which looks very much like a scheme. Well, I say it looks very much like a scheme because if I'm trying to evolve u sub i, u bar sub i from time level n to time level n plus 1. All I need to do 
is that I have now already the information of mu bar i at time level n for all i, so I know all the cell averages. I only need to compute an approximation to u sub i plus half, that is the value of the function at the cell interface. But this is already described before, right? It's the so called reconstruction problem. So I have to use my previous described <coughs> reconstruction procedure to get from u bar i to u of i plus half. And I'm done. So finite volume scheme turns out to be extremely simple. Well, there is a slight complication here. You cannot usually use just f of u i plus half. Because if you use that, you are not paying attention to the very important physics of upwinding, of the fact that the information does not come equally from the left and from the right. There is a wind direction. If the wind blows from the left to the right, you should pay more attention on your left. Otherwise, if the wind changes in the afternoon, the wind goes from this way, then you should probably pay more attention to your right. So this is taken care of by this so-called numerical flux function f hat, which is a function of two variables rather than one. You know f of u is a function of just one variable u, f hat. It's a function of two variables, u minus and u plus. Well, it's increasing in the first argument, decreasing in the second. This number one is the most important property for f hat, for the monotone flux f hat. Basically, you want it to be increasing in the first guy, decreasing in the second, which is, when you write it out very carefully, this is upwinding. This is upwinding. And the other two are sort of uh, trivial requirements, for example, it should be consistent with the physical flux. In other words, if the function agrees on the left and on the right, u minus equals u plus, certainly you want to recover f of u, that's consistency, and this, you need some kind of smoothness, which is Lipschitz continuity. Okay. The example of monotone fluxes include, for example, Gordonov flux, which is given by this formula, the last bridges flux, which is given by this formula, uh, and some other fluxes. I don't know if I have written, yeah, I have written down another one, but there are many monotone fluxes so, uh, that you can use. This is for the, remember, I'm talking about the scalar case. So for the scalar case, you have the concept of monotone fluxes, and you have more than one. So, so you don't have a unique monotone flux. There are many, many, depending on your applications, you can use different ones. Okay, so now let me explain the way of finite volume scheme. Uh, so u minus i plus half and u plus of i plus half are the way of reconstructions. Uh, now, why do you have two of them? So this is, I explained before that the minus and the plus means that I'm using more information on the left or more information on the right. So that is why I have two reconstructed values because you, if you look at this sensor, this is the sensor I described before in that picture that I showed twice. It consists of cells i minus 2, i minus 1, i, i plus 1, i plus 2. Remember, I'm reading the value at i plus half, which is in between these two guys. So, from this point of view, the first sensor here is left biased. It biases to the left, right? Because to the left of i plus half, you have three guys. To the right of i plus half, you have only two guys. So, it is biasing to the left. So this is tensor biases to the left. The Veno approximation, the Veno reconstruction you have obtained using this tensor is naturally denoted by u sub minus at i plus half. Because it is information at i plus half, but it is information obtained with a tensor which biases to the left. That is the meaning of that minus. By the same token, if you use this tensor, which is just a shift of this sensor, right? One less cell to the left and one more cell to the right. And then the i plus half is in the middle of these two guys. Now this time you have three guys to your right and only two to your left. This time it's biasing to the right. The reconstruction you obtain would be called u plus i plus half. So even though these two reconstructions are both, let's say, fifth order accurate approximation 
to the same use of I plus half at the same location, they are actually, uh, usually the values of them are different. In smooth regions, the values of them are different, but they differ in a very small amount. Let's say if both of them are approximations of fifth order accuracy, both of them approximate the same number to data x to the power 5, then their difference, the difference between these two guys should also be data x to the power 5, right? Because if both of you approximate the same guy to data x to the power 5, your distance is also data x to the power 5. So these two numbers in smooth regions will be very, very close. However, if you are near a discontinuity, then these two numbers can be very different. This is because the discontinuity might miss one of these two sensors, right? So then the result will be very different. One of them you might be using more information on the top branch and the other on the bottom branch. Then the values can be very different. At any rate, at any location I plus half, you actually get two reconstructions, two reconstructed values. Then you simply put, sorry, you simply put these two values to this numerical flux, then that will give you a numerical approximation to the f of i plus half. Once you get this, yeah, I will just uh, finish uh, very soon, then we'll take a break. Once you have this, so this is what you already have, right? You pick, you pick, you use the, the reconstruction, wave reconstruction to get u minus and u plus at every i plus half, for every i, then you can put them into f hat, you get this, the right hand side, divided by delta x i. So you get this value at the time level, and you call it L of u bar i, which means it's an operator acting on this collection of cell averages. You get all these values, you put the monotone flux on, you take the difference, you get the residue, called residue on the right. Then you get an ordinary differential equation for u bar, right? Once you have u bar, d dt of u bar equals to some quantity which you can compute. So you write a subroutine which computes this. The subroutine will contain the major part of the subroutine is the Wayno reconstruction subroutine. So you put it there, you compute this Li, and then this is the ODE, then you discretize this ODE by your favorite ODE solver. So for example, you can use uh, SSP, or sometimes called SSP, sometimes called TVD, Yonchikuta time discretization. In this earlier paper showing the OSHA JCP87, it is called TVD Yonchikuta method. Later, in the paper by Rodney, Shu, uh, and Padma, we call it strong stability preserving. It's the same thing, <laughs> it's just the, the in a title I want to use a more fancy name, so we use the, another name, strong stability preserving, but it's the same scheme. So in the third order case, this is the time discretization with the coefficient. Once you know how to compute the L, you compute it. All up forward, you get a value, intermediate value, this value you bar, for instance, is why you store them, you, it's not your final answer yet, you store them, you put this U bar I back to your machinery, Compute the residual on this guy and put it put this back and you get u bar two. Again, you don't use it for the end, you use it as an intermediate value, put it back to the machinery to compute L of it, and put, it, put this sum them up this way with this coefficient. Finally, you get the cell average at the next time level. So the cost is three times of L, three times of all our forward. But the benefit you get is that now it is third order in time. So it is a high order accuracy in space, whatever order in space, third order in time. This machinery can also be adapted to arbitrary high order in time for SSP, for linear problems, and at least to fifth order in time for SSP, for nonlinear problems. So if you want a higher order in time, then you have to switch to a uh, higher order in time for nonlinear problems, you have to switch to a multi step method because the Runge Kota method becomes quite complicated for higher order. For nonlinear, for linear, then you can go to any order. So there are Runge Kota methods for any order of accuracy. So, yeah, so this basically 
is my story on uh, finding the volume. I think this is a good time to break, <laughs> so let's break and have some tea, coffee, and we'll come back maybe in 10 minutes. So let's move on to uh, finite difference schemes. So this is another class of schemes to solve the same problem, ut plus f u s equals 0. But this time, instead of evolving the cell averages, which we use the u bar i to denote before, we are trying to evolve directly the point values u sub i. So in other words, we will be given the point values of the function at the node x equals to x i at time level n. We would want to evolve this bunch of numbers to the next time level. So finite different schemes evolve different sets of variables than finite volume schemes. So if you compare the two, one of them involves integrated quantities, the other involves point values. You might say, well, what's the point, right? Why do you have two schemes, two types of schemes? Later, we will see that for multi-dimensions, there are differences, essential differences among these two, between these two schemes. So right now, let's just try to understand the difference first in one, in one space dimension. So we, the scheme looks very similar as the scheme before. It is still DDT of ui equals to 1 over delta x times a flux difference. So you still have a so-called numerical flux, still denoted by f hat i plus half. But this time, the numerical flux depends on the point values rather than on the cell averages. It depends on the point values of the solution at some neighborhood. For example, from i minus p to i plus q. This f hat should be consistent. In other words, if the function locally is a constant, if every node value u sub i equals to a function equals to a constant u, then you should recover f u. But otherwise, this f hat is still arbitrary at this time. For the time being, let's assume that the data x is uniform. In other words, we have a uniform mesh in space. Okay. So first, let's discuss accuracy. So for in terms of accuracy, because we have this scheme for the scheme is mm, no, this one. The scheme is, you see, ddt of ui plus 1 over delta s of this difference equals to 0. This ui is, is exactly the u. We did not do anything to this PD. Not like before, we integrated this PD. Right now, we did not do anything. So this term corresponds to this term directly at the node x equals to x i. Then this part, this flux difference, should approximate f u sub x at x equals to x i to high order accuracy. Right? So the accuracy requirement is very simple. It should be that this, this part, this flux difference divided by delta x, should approximate f u sub x, this derivative, at x equals to x i to high order accuracy. Right? So this requirement is very natural. The question is, how do I design the flux so that this equality holds? Notice that this is not, from first glance, it is not a trivial requirement because it involves the difference between two fluxes, right? f i, f hat at i plus half minus f hat of i minus half. So if I change one of them, it will affect two such equalities because if I change f hat of 3 plus half, for example, it would affect this formula for i equals to 3, but it would also affect this formula for i equals 4 because for i equals 4, this guy is 4 minus half, which is 3 plus half. So if I change one of them, I will affect two equalities. So there is some interlink of all these requirements making it less clear how I should design f hat i plus half to satisfy this accuracy requirement. However, there is a very simple lemma. Again, in this paper, Shu and Osher, the second one in JCP 88, the first one we did not realize this, so we have a different strategy to do the flux. But the second one, we have this very simple lemma, which is from calculus, that solves the problem. So this is the lemma. So if for the time being, if I assume I can find a function h of x such that this equality holds. This, what this equality means is that if I have a function ux given to me, f of ux of course is another function in x, 
if this function happens to be the sliding average of another unknown function h, you see this is a sliding average. Basically, this h is integrated around, and each x you integrate the h in the interval of length theta x centered at your location. You integrate this function h in this interval, and then you divide it by the by the length. And that is called an averaging, right? So if you average h, suppose you can get f u back. For the time being, you don't ask how you get this h or whether there is such an h or not. Suppose you have such an h. Suppose this equality holds. Then calculus, right? You take the derivative on both sides with respect to x. Remember, delta x here is a constant. Delta x is a constant. It's a uniform mesh. So x appears both here and here. If you take the derivative, then by the uh, whatever calculus, you get this, right? You take it to, to take the derivative on both sides. On the right hand side, you evaluate the derivative at s equals to xi, you get this. On the left side, you evaluate, you take the derivative, x is here and here, you get a difference of h evaluated at the top minus h evaluated at the bottom, which is exactly h of i plus half minus h of i minus half. So this mysterious function h, if I can find it, then you compare these two inequalities, you will immediately see that I should take my numerical class f hat i plus half to be h of i plus half. So if I can take f hat of i plus half to be h of i h of x i plus half, then I'm done. There's no accuracy issue because I am I'm infinitely accurate, right? That that's, this term is wrong. So this is Quite. Of course, that's too good to be true because in practice I don't have this function h. But it tells me that I can take this f hat i plus half to be as accurate as possible to approximate h. Right? If you can have f hat approximating this function h to delta x to the power r plus 1, then this equality will hold because you divide it by delta x. So you lose by order, but then you will have delta x to the r. So, my whole task now is to find a good approximation of this mysterious function h. If I can find a good approximation to it, I have a good flux. Right, so it's a very simple calculus. So how do I find the h? I don't know anything about the h other than this inequality 3. So I have to start from here. But I will show you that it is, uh, yeah, so this is what I basically set, right? You just need to find f hat of i plus half equals to the h or to ensure as order accuracy, uh, then you have to compute this approximation also to r plus minus order of accuracy. Okay, now this is the crucial part. I don't know anything about h, or do I? Actually, I do know something about h. This is the equality h satisfies. Right? H satisfies this equality. So if I evaluate this equality at x equals to xi, then this is from xi minus delta s over 2 to xi plus delta s over 2. And that is exactly the equality I wrote here. This would be f of ui, u of xi, which is ui. I happen to know ui because I'm doing finite difference now. I know the point values. So I know the right hand side. Right? The left hand side is x sub i minus half to x sub i plus half h, because you can see I don't know h. However, this is the definition of h bar. No? It is the definition of the cell average of this mysterious function h. So if you read this equality, aha, I know a lot about h. If I'm given the point values u, i, I already know the cell averages of h. Right? <laughs> no? I'm given. So it's not true that I don't know anything about h. I actually know the cell average of h. So what do I need? Well, I told you that I need h at I told you that I need h at i plus half. 
So now the problem becomes if I know the cell average of H, I need to know the value of H at I plus half. Aha, but this is a problem we studied before. This is reconstruction. Right? Given cell averages, find the value at the interface. That's reconstruction. <laughs> it took a lot of time to study and the finite volume scheme used that. You wrote the code for that. You have a sample routine for that. And to find a difference, just bring it over. So the same set, same sub routine. The only difference is that you feed in different things. This time you feed in f of ui to that sub routine. People ask you why do you feed in this? I should eat cell averages. How do you give me set point values? They say don't come, don't worry. <laughs> Just take my numbers and return something to me that will be useful. Indeed, right? Because this is the cell average of some mysterious function. So then what you return to me will be the value of that function at i plus half. And I should use that as a my numerical flux for accuracy purposes. Right, that should be enough. So you can see immediately that the finite difference poses no additional difficulty to you. If you have already coded the finite volume, you have written this reconstruction subroutine, you can reuse your reconstruction subroutine, no change. The only thing you have to pay attention to is that you have to feed it with different bunch of numbers, and you use the output as your numerical fluxes. So this way, you can write down the finite difference schemes, the code, in very little time. But very, once you have the finite volume code, you can finish the finite difference code in very little effort, with very little effort. So again, I summarize here, same subroutine, different input, for example, u bar i for finite volume, f of u i for finite difference, and different output. For finite volume, you get u plus minus i plus half for your output. Here, you just get the numerical flux as your output. But you ask, oh, no, 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 but still, how about the upwinding? Where did the upwinding go, right? Because here, I have the plus and the minus, and I have a monotone flux, and then I can do upwinding. So how do you do the same thing for finite difference? I already explained accuracy, but I did not explain upwinding stability. That you can do in this way. You can do a so-called flux splitting. In other words, you can write the physical flux as a sum of two fluxes. This in the literature is called flux splitting. The two fluxes has the property that the first flux is positive, the derivative is positive, second flux, the derivative is negative. In other words, for the first flux, the wind always blows from left to right. For the second flux, the wind always blows from right to left. So you get this flux splitting. Uh, there are several different flux splittings. The most convenient one is flux bridges. Flux splitting, very, very simple. For example, written down here, flux bridges, which means uh, you put f u plus minus alpha of u. Alpha here is a constant. You can choose it to be at least this size. You can choose it a little bit bigger also. At least of this size, then the f plus minus u would satisfy the property I spelled out before. In other words, they sum to f of u. And for plus, you take the u derivative if it's positive. For minus, you take the f minus of u f minus of u du, you get a negative quantity. So this is a legitimate, it's a, it is a satisfactory flux splitting. So once you have a, a flux splitting, oh sorry, uh, I did not write down here, uh, what you do, okay, I think I did. So basically, once you have this flux splitting, then you will be able to use Remember, the reconstruction also has biased stencils, right? We do the reconstruction subroutine, but the reconstruction has biased stencils. There is one stencil which has three points to the left and two to the right. I use that to reconstruction to reconstruct for the F plus part. Because the F plus is D F plus U D U is positive, which means the wind always goes from left to right. So I use this bias the sensor to the left to do the reconstruction for this part. 
and I do use the other stencil which bias to the right, do another reconstruction to get the corresponding flux for this part, and I add these two fluxes, numerical fluxes together. So in other words, instead of doing just one reconstruction, I do two. But the finite volume also you have to do two, right? You do the reconstruction for u minus, you do the reconstruction for u plus. This time you do two, but based on different point values, f plus of ui, you use this stencil on the left. f minus of ui, you use the stencil bias to the right. You do two different reconstructions. You get the corresponding numerical fluxes. You sum them up. That will be your numerical flux. Let's try to recall, right? So from this point of view, the finite difference scheme is basically, you can say, it's an add-on to finite volume because the majority part, which is the reconstruction, is the same. And the cost would also be the same. And the result would be very similar. You can do your own computer verification. You can write both codes, and you can compute the same problem. You can see, you compare the results. You can see that they are almost the same. Well, very similar. They will, they will not be identical, because after all, you are using the reconstruction subroutine with different inputs and different outputs, right? So you should not get the same answer, but the answers will be very close to each other. So here is what I'm saying, comparison. Uh, the, the, what is this color? Uh, blue. Uh, this color will be the, the good ones, good properties. And this red color will be the not so good properties. So for finite volume schemes, it's based on cell averages. These are facts, right? These black guys are just stating the facts. It's based on cell averages, based on reconstruction from cell averages, two point values from minus, from plus, two different reconstructions. You can use any numerical flux I've had on these numbers. It does not need uniform or smooth meshes. This I did not mention, but actually the reconstruction does not care if the mesh is uniform or not. So these two are actually advantages of finite volume schemes. You can use any monotone flux, and you can use non-uniform mesh. The problem is that it will be more costly in multi-dimensions. This I will explain later. We just state here as a fact first. And for finite difference schemes, the first two lines are just stating the facts. Again, it is based on point values. And you use the reconstruction, the same reconstruction procedure to reconstruct from the point values of f plus of ui to get an f hat plus of u uh, of i plus half, and f minus of ui to get f hat minus of i plus half. So two different reconstructions with different inputs and different stencils, you get two different outputs, different numerical fluxes, you add them up, this is your final uh, numerical flux. The problem, these are the bad parts corresponding to final difference. The first problem is that you need this flux splitting. So it is less flexible than final volume. Final volume, you can use any monotone flux. I already gave three examples, there are more. And flux splitting is more demanding. Even though flux splitting corresponds to a monotone flux, but not every monotone flux can be written in a flux splitting format with smooth f plus and f minus. I also need smoothness because I'm doing reconstructions on each of them. So if each of them is not smooth, one of them is not smooth, then the reconstruction will not be very accurate. So I need this smooth flux splitting, which is a drawback. I also need a uniform mesh. For this part, it's less apparent, right? You might say, well, why do you need a uniform mesh? Uh, well, if you follow my previous derivation, you will see that I use the calculus. I take the derivative on both sides with respect to x. I can do that only if data x is constant. If data x also depends on x, then I get a whole bunch of other terms. So this is of course superficial this, and you can say, well, we use this derivation, you get that, maybe another clever way of deriving, you can use no uniform mesh as well, but I don't think so. So I think there's finite difference in this particular framework, conservative finite difference, 
you really need to use uniform or smooth meshes. So this is a drawback. However, the big advantage of finite difference is for multi-dimensions. Again, I will mention it just in, in a few minutes. So I just proved down the facts. Yeah. Okay, so now let's look at multi-dimensions. I <laughs> claim that multi-dimensions, finite volume and the finite difference would make a big difference, right? So let's see why they are di very different in two dimensions for finite volume and for finite difference. So we have this two-dimensional conservation law here written down Fut plus Fux plus Guy equals to zero. Okay, first finite volume. Now the notation becomes messy and it's bear with me. So we have a box x sub i plus minus half to x plus i plus half. This is an x interval times a y interval y of j minus half y of j plus half. So this is a square box, right? Square box here. x i minus half, x i plus half, y of j minus half, y of j plus half box. So you integrate the PDE over the box, what do you get? Well, you integrate the PDE over the box, you get the cell average. Of course, you integrate the PDE and divide it by the box area. You get the cell average on the left. You get 1 over the areas. Uh, I'm sorry. I? No, I think it's correct. You get this negative sign because I moved everything to the right. You get this 1 over theta x theta y because I have divided 1 over theta x theta y here also to get the cell average. So this is a notation for cell average. In other words, you integrate the function over the box and divide it by the box area. You get these four terms because if you integrate the conservation law before, let's look at the previous thing. If you integrate this guy over x over y, d dx, you integrate x, you get the contribution of f of u on the right minus f of u on the left. But you also have to integrate over y. So in other words, you will get what is on the right minus what is on the right. Both of them integrated in y. Right? So that is why you get actually not a very clean formula as in y. You get the integral in y of f evaluated at x i plus half, which is this box, the right boundary of the box, minus the integral along the left boundary of the box, right? So these two terms. Same thing for g. Basically, you integrate g, you get the integral of g horizontally on top, minus the integral of g horizontally on bottom. So it's kind of a divergence theorem, right? You integrate over the box, you get contributions from four sides. Two dimensional integrals, the boundary terms become one dimensional integrals. So this time it is messy. You get this evolution of the cell average equals to this. So if you want to convert this to a scheme, you would have to approximate the right hand side to a desirable accuracy. Okay. So how do you do that? Let me fix some notations. Let me call this double cell average to be u bar delta. So integral of the function over the box, over the box size. In particular, let me explain the notation bar and delta more clearly. The bar means that it is an integrating, it is an averaging operator in x. In other words, we fix y which is the notation j here, the fixed at y equals y j, and we integrate over the x interval divided by the x length. This operator is called bar. The delta operator is you fix x at x i, you integrate over y over this interval, and then you get the average in y. I just use a different notation, call it delta. And if you do both, it doesn't matter which one you do first. You do both, one half the other, you get the new bar delta, which is a two-dimensional cell average. So with this notation, with this notation, I'm going to get something which looks slightly better. The previous 
formula becomes a little bit shorter because recall that this has not changed. This one used to be an integral, used to be an integral uh, in, okay, so here is still definition, sorry. So this is a finite volume scheme and I would want this numerical flux to approximate this guy because the theoretical equality that I have shown before is exactly like that with this thing replaced by this if you recall the previous right this, this guy this guy is uh, y i minus half y of j plus half of f of u dy and that is this guy, right? This guy. So if I want a, a numerical scheme which looks like this to approximate the previous equality nicely, I would want this guy to approximate this terrible integration, which, by the way, is f total. Why is it f total? Remember what is delta? Recall that the delta is the cell average operator in y is integrating over y interval divided by the length. That's the total operator. And this is exactly the total operator acting on f. Right? So this is shorthand notation for this. It's integral in y over the interval y j minus half to j plus half divided by the length. So that is the operator f delta. So f hat should equal to f delta, should approximate f delta. And g hat should approximate g bar because this thing is an integral in x by my previous notation this is g bar so in other words I can find this good scheme if I can find f delta and g bar to high order accuracy now let me show you a very simple maybe misleadingly simple example suppose I have a linear conservation model which means f of u is a times u where a is a constant g of u is b times u where b is also a constant then what would be remember we did say that f hat should be very close to f delta but what is f delta? f delta is f integrated in y but f is just a constant times a a constant a times u so if you integrate the constant a times u over y, a can go out. It's a constant. So it's just the integrating of u in y. If you integrate u in y, the notation, our notation, if you integrate u in y, it is u delta, right? u delta is the cell averaging operator in y. So in this particular case, I can just take f hat to be u delta, a times u delta, and I can take g hat to be b times u bar in this particular case. In other words, if I have a way to find u delta and u bar, I'm done, right? I can take the numerical flux to be them and I already formulated the final volume scheme. So the question for this particularly simple example is how do you get from the double cell average to single cell average? How do you find from u bar delta to u delta? And how do you find from u bar delta to u bar? But this is easy because let's say this first part. If you treat u bar as if you treat u delta, sorry, if you treat u delta as a function, then I already told you that if you first take a bar or first take delta, you get the same result. You first integrate it in x or you first integrate it in y, you get the same result. So if you take, so this is why I need a blackboard. So if you take, you switch this order, then u delta, if you treat u delta as a new function called v, for example, then this would be a procedure for v bar to v. v bar to v. This is one dimensional, right? You want to get from the x cell, cell average of v to the function value of v. It's one dimensional. <coughs> so the delta is just 
part of the passive, it's a part of we. So from here to here, it is a one-dimensional reconstruction, of course, per line. So each line you have to do this one-dimensional reconstruction. You can get on um, the doubles average to your delta. By the same token, you do a one-dimensional reconstruction, each stripe one-dimensional in y, you get from u bar delta to u bar. This time, you don't even to switch, you need to switch the order. You call this new bar here to be w, and then this is w delta to w. So one-dimensional cell average in y back, going back to the point of value in y. And in this case, it's one-dimensional, and you have the one-dimensional subroutine to do this job. So for this particularly simple application, which has this linear class, you have actually a simple one-dimensional, yeah, I did not, I probably said it here. You have two one-dimensional reconstruction per cell, then you can get the scheme. You can get all the fluxes. So the cost per cell cost is only double, is only twice the per cell cost of one-dimensional scheme. The one-dimensional scheme, you have only one reconstruction to do, right? Here you have two, one in x, the other in y. But each of them, you are calling the one-dimensional reconstruction subroutine. So each of them costs the same thing as 1D. So the per cell cost in 2D is twice the per cell cost in 1D. Of course, you have more cells. That's a different issue. But per cell cost in 2D is only twice that of per cell cost of 1D. So this is the best you can hope. Because you have F U sub X, you have G U sub Y, you have two guys there, so you have to double, right? The amount of work you do per cell. So this for this PDE, the final volume scheme is fine. It is always implemented in a fast fashion. It, you can use the one-dimensional subroutine that you wrote. The cost is only twice per cell then compared with the one-dimensional case. So everything is nice. However, your luck basically stops here. This is true only for this simple conservation law. If you have a nonlinear conservation law, F u and G u are nonlinear functions of u, then this fact is not true anymore. F of u delta is not F of u per the whole thing delta. What do I mean? I mean, if you first take the integral in y, you get the cell average in y, and then you put the f on top of it, f is a nonlinear function, let's say square. You first take the integral and then you square the result. It is not equal to the fact that you first take uh, the square, and then you take the integral, right? Integral then square is not equal to square then integral. You can try it out yourself. It's true only if you have a linear function, right? F u equals 2 times u, that's fine. You first multiply it by 2 and then you integrate. It's the same as you first integrate then multiply it by 2. So that's my previous example. But here, the nonlinear function, it is no longer true. So you cannot just get from this to this, then you are done. You, it's not done. Because you need to get to integrals of f of it, so f of anything you have to get the point values of u before you can put f on top of it, the nonlinear f on top of it. So you have to go all the way from the double cell averages to single cell averages in y to point values. From single cell average to point values is another one-dimensional reconstruction. Once you have point values, for example, at the Gaussian points, then you can approximate this numerical flux, which is an integral. Remember, it's an integral of f. But if you know the values of f at the quadrature points, you can sum them up with suitable weights. You get a good approximation to the integral. So the cost is, is a reconstruction, one-dimensional reconstruction to get u delta, another one-dimensional reconstruction to get the point values, and then sum them up to get the flux. So this time, the cost is big. Even though the code is still reasonably simple, 
because you still use only one-dimensional reconstructions. But the cost, for example, here at least, this is uh, two guys, uh, two one-dimensional reconstructions plus a summation. And you get you do the same thing also for the other guy. For the, for the this is for f of x. You do the same thing for g of y. So the cost is at least four one-dimensional reconstructions per cell. Because two in this in this one, and also two for the g delta. So g hat. So you need four one-dimensional reconstructions per cell. This is four times the cost of 1D, not two times the cost of 1D anymore. Plus, you have this summation to do, which is some additional cost. So the two-dimensional algorithm is at least twice as expensive as it should be. What I say should be is that if you are optimal in per cell cost is only doubling that of 1D, I say that should be your cost. But this time at least it's twice. It's more than twice actually. And in 3D it's at least three times. It's actually more than three times because of this summation. So this is a fact that you cannot avoid because it's a nonlinearity playing with integrations. So it's just a pure mathematical. It's an inconvenience, but there's no way you can get around it. So finite volume schemes are very expensive in multi-D. So I hope I have convinced you that this fi why finite volume schemes is very expensive in multi-D. On the other hand, finite difference schemes in multi-D is straightforward. For example, if you want to solve this PDE using this conservative scheme, and these guys are just point values of u at the cell center u, x equals to xi, y equals to yg. It should be approximated by these class differences. However, if you look at this guy, for, for fixed GA, if I fix GA here, this is just saying that I should use the flux difference at i plus half minus the flux at i minus half divided by delta x to approximate f u sub x at this location. So x derivative. But x derivative is a one-dimensional concept, right? When you take a derivative, it is a one-dimensional concept. So if I know my value along this line, this x line, is enough information for me to compute the approximation to the x derivative. I don't need to know anything in front of me or anything behind me. So I can use my one-dimensional subroutine to compute the flux difference approximation to the x derivative here. By the same token, I can use one-dimensional subroutine along the y line to compute the approximation, conservative approximation to the y derivative at this location. So I'm done, right? I compute these guys use one-dimensional routine, use this guys use one-dimensional routine. I put them together. I get the approximation to the right-hand side to update the point values. So the cost is exactly twice per point. Cost is exactly twice that of one D, right? Because the twice is because I need to compute f u sub x and g u sub y, but no more. So this is also true for 3D, for any D. Also, the code is simple, right? There's no complicated delta bar or these things. I only have one dimension. So if I do have the one dimensional finite difference code, you just put another loop outside. It becomes a two dimensional finite difference code. So to convert one dimensional finite difference code to 2D is very simple. To convert a finite volume code from 1D to 2D is pretty significant, as you can see before, right? You have all these middle steps to do. So both com uh, programming complexity and computational cost, finite difference is clearly a winner in terms of uh, cost and the simplicity. So I summarize it here, right? Conclusion of comparison in multi-D. In 2D, finite volume scheme. So this color is uh, uh, bad things about finite volume and good things for finite difference. And this is good things about finite volume. 
Okay, the bad thing is that first of all it's more expensive. It is at least twice, two to five times here. This depends on how you code. So, but at least twice. Expensive. That find a difference. And in 3D, this factor is bigger. It's at least 3D. Uh, this is yeah, I said in 3D is bigger. So this is the negative side. The positive side of final difference is that still it does not need uniform mesh. It does not even need a Cartesian mesh. So you can actually construct uh, finite volume schemes on unstructured mesh. So this is the good part of finite volume. But the cost is really big. And also the unstructured mesh, the finite volume schemes look very complicated. So it's not easy to code. But at least you can do that. So that's the advantage. So this is the disadvantage. Of course, for finite difference, it goes the other way around. Okay, so I hope I have sort of uh, very uh, roughly convinced you that finite difference scheme has an advantage for multi-D, so you keep this in mind. In 1D, really there's no reason to use finite difference because the two schemes are of the same computational cost. They are 90% identical, the code are 90% identical because they use the same subroutine for reconstruction. And so why, why bother keeping two versions? <laughs> so final volume will be good enough. More flexible, you can use it on general mesh and so on. But for 2D, you might seriously want to consider using final difference because it is much cheaper, right? Much cheaper in terms of CPU cost and in terms of programming. Much more, uh, less uh, compli com complicated. OK, so how about the system? So these are scalar cases. 1D or DD. Systems, you do a so-called characteristic decomposition. You don't have to do this. You can, one cheap way of doing system computations is to treat system as a bunch of scalar equations and just treat each equation in the previous way. So you can do that for some numerical fractions like Lance Bridges, uh, Rosanoff, and there are some other fractions which do not care about the characteristics, so you can use them. And you can do component by component. Most of the time it would work, especially for schemes which are not very high order. For example, third order schemes, sometimes fifth order schemes, it would work. Cost would be small, everything would be nice. But for very high order schemes or for very strong shocks, you may have oscillations, so this would be a problem. So the, a more sophisticated way to do it is to do it this way. You have this hyperbolicity, which means that f of u has a derivative, which remember f here is a vector function of u. So f prime of u is a matrix, which is called Jacobian. This Jacobian is supposed to have real eigenvalues and a complete set of eigenvectors for hyperbolic problems. For example, all these things are documented for Euler equations, for MHD, or for many, many physically relevant applications. This matrix R, this matrix lambda, they are all well documented. Lambda consists of, this a diagonal matrix consisting of eigenvalues. They are all real. And R is a matrix whose columns are eigenvectors. So right eigenvectors are this R. So R inverse exists because these eigenvectors are complete. So R inverse exists. R inverse actually has a physical meaning as well. Each row of R inverse is a left eigenvector of F prime. So of course we know that this equality holds, and we have these explanations here. So for your application, you would want to find analytical formulas of all these matrices. So for all our equations, it's documented in many many papers and books. For if you have a new system, for example, MHD is also documented somewhere. If you have yet another new system, you might need to do the homework, use Mathematica, or whatever, to find all these matrices. Once you have these matrices, then you can perform a so-called local characteristic decomposition. Local characteristic decomposition, which is used to avoid uh, spurious oscillations. So this is how you do it. Suppose your scheme uses 
five points in the stance of j minus 2, j minus 1, j, j plus 1, j plus 2. Suppose your skin uses all these things. Then these, these are all vectors, right? You bump j minus 2, you bump j minus 1, cell average vectors. You do the following. You first find a middle state. You had j plus half. This is at the location j plus half. And you find this based on cell averages. You, you can do it in several different ways. The best way is, is you can find in some paper that there is a low average of these two guys, which has this property, mean value theorem. So notice that mean value theorem doesn't always hold for vector functions. <laughs> we should know that. But if it does hold, then you can find this new hat. Usually it's well documented, for example, in Phil Rowe's paper, for well, gas dynamics equations, low average is well documented, and so on. So then you use this new hat, which is the low average, as you are, you have the plus half. If you cannot find the low average, you can also take just the simple arithmetic average. So this is fine also. And once you have this, then you evaluate your R matrix. Remember, R is the matrix corresponding to the right eigenvectors. I said that you should have formulas for them. So by now you have u. By now you have u. You can compute r u. So I have u hat. Then I compute r u hat. I denote it by r j plus half. And also I find its inverse. These are all documented. You have formulas on these two things. Then what do I do? I simply compute another set of vectors v v j plus k is u bar j plus k multiplied from the left by R inverse. So notice that I'm trying to compute the value at j plus half, the flux or the reconstruction, so on. I first pick several neighboring cell averages. I first freeze myself at j plus half, find a low average here, or maybe arithmetic mean. I find a matrix R here, matrix R inverse here. I then compute all these so-called projections R inverse times these cell averages to the to, to my to, to this R. So I get several new vectors which are called V. And I apply the window reconstruction or whatever reconstruction procedure on V, on each component of V, to get V J plus half. Once I get these things, I map it back to U J plus half by R. In other words, all this sophisticated procedure of window reconstruction, which are highly nonlinear, is done on each component of V rather than on each component of U. You first compute V from U. You apply window on V, and you find the result, and you project back from V back to U. So this is, of course, very costly, right? It's, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a projection to a different coordinates compute over there and project it back. So this projection back and forth will cost you a lot. So you, what I want to say is it's necessary. Well, as I mentioned, sometimes you can get by without it, but you can always cook a tough enough situation that this will really help, even though it's very costly. So you can do this thing. Multi-dimensional problems, you perform the same procedure, but along each normal direction. For example, if you have a box, on each side you have a normal direction. Along the normal direction, the problem becomes one-dimensional. So then you apply the same procedure along that direction. Of course, when you compute the, this side on x direction, the normal would be different. Then you perform a different characteristic decomposition for computing the flux here. So in multi-dimensions, the procedure is the same, but you have to do this multiple times. Basically, each edge you have to do one. So that's, again, an additional cost involved in there. Uh, yeah, so I think this is a good time to break. <laughs> so basically, I've finished describing the basics. I'm, I'm going pretty fast because I, my host told me that People here are very advanced and smart, so you don't have to talk about the basics. 
So, <laughs> so I'm going a little bit fast, uh, but still I think I have conveyed the, the essential ideas. So if you need more, you can always read my lecture notes and the, the papers and so on. But I think the basic things are already there. We can uh, uh, safely say that you would understand the basics of finite difference, finite volume, the basics of Wiener reconstruction, and why the reconstruction is relevant for both finite volume and the finite difference. Right? It's, uh, uh, for finite difference, is because of this small lemma that I mentioned, and as well as why in multi dimensions finite difference is preferred over finite volume. I hope all this basic information is conveyed to you. So we break and then we use the remaining hour to discuss some recent developments. Uh, okay, so the third part of the talk today, the lecture today, will be on some recent developments and applications. I think uh, I, I overestimated my time. I think I will concentrate. If you need more time, we can stay a bit longer. Yeah, I, I think I will more or less concentrate on the first topic because this is uh, uh, something I think is very relevant in application of finite difference schemes. So the first uh, topic is the so-called inverse last window of type boundary treatments. This is a technique for using finite difference schemes which are usually defined on uniform meshes on boxes to approximate problems in complex geometry. If you have a problem which is defined in a complex geometry, you still want to use finite difference. You certainly face the problem of boundary conditions. So two difficulties associated with numerical boundary conditions. Uh, the first one is that uh, high of high the finite difference schemes involve a wide stencil. So for example, the fifth of the window schemes we talked before, it's a five-point stencil. If you count up in the down in the, it is a six-point stencil. So if you have so many points in the stencil that are near the boundary, you either have to use ghost points, or you would have to change your computational algorithm near the boundary. You just don't have enough <coughs> in your stencil. So this is the first difficulty. For example, if you have this scheme, which computes un uh, plus 1 sub j using j minus 2, j minus 1, j and j plus 1 at time level n. Then, in order to compute this equation, you notice that the point is, uh, is biased, right? It's the center is around j. You have two points to the left and one to the right. This is suitable for this equation, ut plus ux equals 0 uh, for upending purpose. And uh, usually for this equation, you have the initial condition, you also have the boundary condition on the left. For example, if x equals to 0 is your computational boundary, then you are given the value of the solution u evaluated at x equals to 0 for arbitrary t to be a function gt, which is a given function. So you would want to use this scheme to compute this problem to third order accuracy. However, this scheme cannot be applied to obtain the value at j equals to 1. Because with j equals to 1, you would need u sub 1 minus 2. In other words, you need u sub minus 1. So either you have to provide the value of u minus 1, which is usually called a ghost point, or you would have to change the scheme to compute u sub 1. You cannot use the original. Right. So this is the first difficulty. This boundary treatment has a second difficulty, which is to say the computational domain, the boundary of the computational domain may not coincide with grid points. This is especially the case for multi-D. Suppose you want to compute an arbitrary shaped domain, but you put a box, you put a just rectangular mesh covering it, then certainly this boundary of the domain does not coincide, usually does not coincide with your grid. So this is the second difficulty. Even in 1D, you could imagine that x equals 0, this physical boundary is between two nodes, right? Between two grid points. It's not landing at the grid point. You might say, well, this is artificial. Why don't you just put your grid there? Why do you, why do you put it in between? 
Well, this is true. However, even in Randy, if your mesh is, if your domain is moving, your mesh is fixed, then you still have this problem because one of them is moving, the other is fixed. You always have the situation that the boundary does not land on the grid. So this, this in 2D, of course, even if it doesn't move, you still have the same difficulty that the computational, the boundary of the domain does not coincide with the grid. So this causes several difficulties. The major difficulty, one of the major difficulties in the small cell problem here, the boundary is called the cut cell problem, which affects the uh, time step for stability. So there are a lot of work in the literature studying how to treat this difficulty. For example, the edge box method of Berger, Halsey, and the like. So basically, the idea is that you want to avoid having a very small cell near the boundary. For example, if your physical boundary is here, your first grid point is here, the distance between them is very, very small comparing with a regular grid size, regular grid size, then this small cut cell would affect your CFL condition for stability, and you want to avoid that. You can use this kind of techniques, but they are usually restricted to second order accuracy. Also, another difficulty, is that you have usually a wall boundary in complex geometry, you have a wall reflecting, and then it is very difficult to do a curved wall on rectangular meshes. Okay. So how do you do this kind of things? Well, you have usually using you can use actual collation to obtain ghost point values, and then you can study the stability of the resulting scheme. This has been done by a series of papers by Kress and his school. For example, all these papers. You can perform a GKS stability analysis. GKS stands for Gustafsson, Kress, and S. I don't know the full name. Uh, three people. They have this analysis, stability analysis, for initial boundary value problems. So you can do this analysis. But it, this technique does not solve the problem of small cell. What we are going to do is an inverse Lux Vendorf procedure, which I will try to explain. So it, since I use the terminology of inverse Lux Vendorf procedure, I will first explain what is the Lux Vendorf procedure, regular Lux Vendorf procedure. The regular Lux Vendorf procedure is the procedure that you use to derive Lux Vendorf scheme. This is how it goes. You have the equation PDE. You write out the tail expansion in time. So un plus 1 is equal to un. Here I did not write n, but everything on the right hand side is evaluated at time level n. Is you have u plus ut times delta t plus half ut t plus delta t squared plus etc. <laughs> so this is a uh, tail expansion in time. Then what you do, the last mental procedure, is you replace ut using the PDE by ux. For example, ut is just minus ux. utt, you don't see utt directly here, but you can take the t derivative on both sides. <coughs> you get utt equals to uxt minus uxt. You reverse the order is utx, but you have ut here already. You substitute the in here, you get uxx. So utt is equal to uxx. By doing this, you can replace all these time derivatives by spatial derivatives, by repeatedly using the PDE. So this is the essential ingredient of the last Wendorf procedure. Once you have the spatial derivatives, then you are free to use your favorite finite difference operator to approximate them. So then you can get the last Wendorf scheme and other schemes which are uh, high order in space and time. OK, so this is the regular last Wendorf. So now I just reverse. <laughs> space and time to get the inverse last bunch of procedure. So this is what you do. You are trying to solve ut plus ux equals 0. You are given a boundary condition u at x equals 0, t is gt. Your problem is that, first of all, x equals 0 is not necessarily at a grid point. So its closest grid point x and y is a times delta x away from this boundary. Or a could be one half, it could be any number. It may not be an integer. 
And you can do this for x2 and so on. For x2, this a would be, again, a different a. If for x1, it is a. For x2, it would be a plus 1 times delta x. Anyway, it is some multiple of delta x away from x equals 0. So this is what you do. You perform this time a tidal expansion in space before you were performing a tidal expansion in time, right? So this time you perform a tidal expansion in space. Inwards, right? So u sub 1, which is the value of u evaluated at x equals to x1, is equal to u evaluated at 0 plus ux at 0 times the distance between x1 to 0, which is a times theta x, plus 1 half ux x times a times theta x squared plus so you can keep as many terms as you wish up to the order of accuracy you want. Then you repeatedly use the PDE to revert the x derivative by spatial. The spatial derivative by time derivative is just the reverse of last one job. Last one job is to replace time derivative by spatial. Here you replace the spatial by time. So ux is minus ut, uxx is utt and so on. So ux is minus ut, so ux at 0, x equals 0, is just minus ut at 0, but we know that u at 0 is gt. So the t derivative, you already know, is minus g prime of t. So once you convert everything to x equals 0, you can take as many t derivatives as you wish, because you know the boundary value for all time. So ux is just g minus g prime of t. On the other hand, uxx after the procedure becomes utt, which is g double prime t, and so on. So you get all these things. That means you plug these things in here, you already get u1 to arbitrary order of accuracy that you wish. So this is a process that you can use to compute either ghost values our values of the solution in the first few grid points inside the computational domain to high order accuracy by utilizing the given boundary condition. So it's as simple as that. So this way, you don't need your boundary to be aligned with your grid. So your grid point may not land on the boundary, but however, you can do this tile expansion and you move your information to the boundary and then utilizing the boundary data very expensively. You see, you use not only g of t, but also g prime of t, g double prime t, and so on. Of course, you ask, what happens if I'm not given gt by a formula, I'm only given the boundary data by a table, for example? Then you could use finite difference. You could even use Vino here, you know, here to compute these derivatives to the desired accuracy. So essentially, this is the inverse last window procedure. Uh, uh, then let me explain that in a few more complex situations, how does it work? So first of all, you have this Hamilton-Jacobi, which actually the work of inverse last window started when we were trying to solve Hamilton-Jacobi equations, steady-state Hamilton-Jacobi equations. So when the Hamilton-Jacobi equation we put the time here, we can drive this to steady state, but this is very, very slow. So there is a faster way of doing this, which is the so-called fast sweeping method, which is a class of method which tries to solve Hamilton-Jacobi equation, steady state Hamilton-Jacobi equation in a faster way. It was started with uh, a boy and Dupi. Dupi is a, a professor, is a, my colleague at Brown University. In the paper and later, Hong Kai Zhao and uh, Stanley Osher and many people, uh, including ourselves, we extended this, uh, uh, this work, fast sleeping. Uh, but this is, uh, I'm not going to describe what is fast sleeping, but what I'm trying to say is that even with fast sleeping, you still have difficulties in this boundary condition. So for example, if the problem is defined on a box, this is a box, and then if you are given the boundary at, say, x equals 0, you are given the boundary value, you still use high order methods, you still need to get phi of ij at the first two grid points. So for example, this is the computational domain. You are given the boundary condition along this line, but since it is a high order scheme, you still need to know the values of two lines inside the computational domain 
uh, data axis and two data axis away from this boundary before you can use Wayno, right? Wayno would start from here using a three point stencil, then you can do that. But the first two points you need to do it using another technique. And this is the perfect place that we can use the words last range of. So this is how you do it. For example, you sub x i y j, if i is 1 or 2, it would equal to 5 at 0 plus i times h times i is 1, that is h, i is 2 is 2h plus uh, times 5x, and then i h squared over 2, 5xx, and so on. You can continue. And then you would just be able to get uh, this equality. And you have this boundary condition, phi 0 is already g, you know that. So you get this equality. So h of phi x g prime, because this is phi y, but phi y is just g prime. You give the value of the solution along this line, you can take the y derivative here, no problem. You get g prime y j equals to this. If you read the equation 8, the only unknown is phi x. So this is why you can get phi x out of the given value of the boundary data at the right hand side. So you solve for phi x. When you solve for phi x, you need this to be invertible. But it is invertible because of this characteristic condition. So if you can prescribe boundary condition here, then it means this derivative is positive. It's an inflow. If it is not an inflow, you cannot prescribe boundary condition here for hyperbolic problems. So this is condition is satisfied, hence this has a solution. You get a phi x. Once you get a phi x, you then compute using, uh, you take the derivative, you get this inequality. Well, in this inequality, the only thing which is unknown is this phi x y, because you already have phi x, all these genes you have. You only do not know phi y, phi x y. This time, this is uh, multiplied by this guy, which is positive. So you just divide it over, so you get 5xy by immediately writing it out. You repeat this procedure, you get all these derivatives you want. So then you get the first two lines of points, then you can uh, start the fast sweeping, starting from the third line. So this was actually the first thing we did of this inverse last window procedure, which worked very nicely, so we are very happy. Because before, when people were using fast sweeping, when they have the problem of points near the boundary, they don't know what to do, they were usually doing two things. The first thing is that they put the exact solution there. <laughs> this is certainly cheating, <laughs> you don't know the exact solution, otherwise you don't compute. But for testing purposes, it's fine. Put the exact solution there, you compute. And so the second thing is that you use some lower order scheme there, let's say a first order scheme to compute the first couple of points and then you start high order. But this is very bad because for this steady state problems, all the information comes from the boundary. So if you mess up the first couple of points, if the values of the first couple of points are not accurate, the information, the inaccuracy will be carried into the domain. So it doesn't matter if you use high order schemes inside, you still get pretty, pretty low accurate results. So this uh, procedure, this inverse last window procedure helped us a lot. So we have some computational uh, examples here that you can see that it, you get to uh, uh, good accuracy and good results. And also here, for example, you can compute. So this is also something we like a lot. Before, if you have this kind of domain, this is a circle domain, you have to use a grid which is aligned with the circles or polar coordinates, for example. But now we are using just the regular rectangular grid. Right? If you use rectangular grid, then the boundary of your physical domain does not coincide with your <coughs> grid point at all. But this last window procedure doesn't care that this inverse last window procedure. You don't need it to. You just need the point to be close to the boundary so that you can do parallel expansion. You don't have to have it on the boundary. Curved or not, it doesn't matter to us because we are just using the tangential derivative and the normal derivative. So everything is very, very nice. So you can compute, for example, this problem using a box, uh, using a rectangular box mesh. So it's very convenient. And you get results which uh, looks very nice. This is a third order method. 
So this, uh, yeah, as like, like I said, this procedure started with uh, uh, Kamit Jacobi uh, in this uh, paper, which is part of uh, Lin Huang's PhD thesis uh, back in 2008. Uh, and then it's picked up for higher order uh, fast sweeping in this paper and also in uh, DG method for uh, uh, fast sweeping in this paper. Even in DG, you need this procedure because DG, for example, if you have a point source uh, here, you only know the value of the solution at one point. However, you need to have, a, let's say, a rectangle or a triangle covering this point. And how do you define the DG solution on this triangle if you only know one point value? Right? It, 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 unless you put a constant there, but then it is not accurate. If you want to put a polynomial there, you still need to use this procedure to compute the next derivatives. So this procedure is very handy when, even when you are using DG scheme, which I will describe tomorrow. Okay, for time-dependent PDEs, I explained before this thing was last went off, where you have T. Uh, for example, you have this conservation of 2D, all the equations in 2D, uniform Cartesian mesh, and you have a domain, which is not aligned with the mesh. For example, in the right case, again, it's a nonlinear. You have this inflow on the left boundary. What you do, just like my example before, you perform Taylor expansion. This is Taylor expansion in space. You get all these spatial derivatives. You replace these spatial derivatives by time derivatives. You replace, for example, how do you replace that? For example, the first derivative, spatial derivative, is equal to that, which is equal to this. Then you ask, is this always divisible? Well, yes, it is, because if for inflow, you always have f prime positive in order to be an inflow. So this thing is always a positive number. But this also indicates one potential difficulty of this procedure, namely, what happens when you are close to a characteristic boundary? What happens near the point where f prime is zero? Right? Then you cannot divide. So you do need to do some special things near those characteristic boundaries. So that's uh, one thing to caution using this process. But it can be handled very nicely. The formulas can be complicated, just as those of you who have done last range of procedure for time for high order <laughs> multi-dimension system. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite costly, quite long formulas. This is also for inverse last window, it's also quite long, quite costly. And so 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 much so that my PhD student Sri Tan, uh, who did this work for conservation loss, he basically at the beginning refused to go beyond the third order for multi-dimensional systems. Some students. Three. <laughs> I'm not going to go into five. <laughs> Problem is too long. So later, well, three is really fine, fine. But I still want five. So what do we do? Later, we find out actually this complex inverse last range of procedure is important only for the leading term, only for u x x. Oh, sorry, only for u x. U x equals to u g. As long as you use that term correctly, all the remaining u x x, u x x x, and so on, you use regular extrapolation, the whole procedure is stable and accurate. So after we found this, then we can go to any other. Right? So then we went to fifth order. So if you use every ux, ux, x, ux, x, x, and so on, all of them by this procedure is it, indeed it's very messy. So but there is a cheaper way to do that. So at the end of the day, this procedure is quite nice. You can show in a limited case that this procedure is stable. In GKS, of course, these are for model problems. But more importantly, more importantly, <coughs> this procedure can be implemented for two-dimensional or three-dimensional Euler equations with very complex geometry with reflect with wall boundary conditions. So this is what I like the most. Because there are a lot of applications for which, for example, we are computing a determination 
uh, uh, problem, uh, I mean, uh, propagation of uh, flames problem. For example, it is a fire or whatever going through this room, and this, this pillar, this, 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 box, this uh, table, and so on. So the geometry is very complicated. And one way, of course, you can use a body fitted mesh to, to compute. But that's quite nasty and it's not easy to cope. The other way is just to use rectangular grid to cut through all these things and then you use this particular trick to compute. It's a reflecting boundary condition across all these surfaces, which can be implemented very nicely. So we have done that actually with some very good results. Yeah, so this is what I was talking about, this last bullet. We found a simplified and improved version with relatively, uh, uh, for which the relatively complicated inverse last winter procedure is applied only to the first order normal derivative, so the ux term. So if you only apply this term, it turns out to be crucial. If you don't do this, then you go back to the old days that it's unstable. But if you take care of the first term, it's a little bit like in the last window of procedure, if you take care of the first term by characteristic decomposition, or the remaining terms, you can do central difference, no problem. So, uh, so this, yeah, so this can help a lot in our numerical tests, simplify the procedure. So let me show you some numerical tests. Uh, this is Burgess equation, so one space dimension with a boundary condition at x equals to zero. On the, uh, uh, sorry, x equals to minus 1 and given boundary condition. You can see that you get fifth order accuracy very nicely in this procedure. And you also get, so one concern that we had at the beginning is that this procedure utilizes the PDE in the differential form repeatedly. So we were wondering whether if you have a discontinuity coming from the boundary, Right. The boundary data is discontinuous. So a discontinuity is coming from the boundary to inside the computation no domain. Just like here, the discontinuity is coming from the boundary into the computational domain. What would happen? Whether you would get oscillatory results or not. Uh, beginning with a little bit of body, but it turns out that no problem. <laughs> we know it's kind of powerful. So it actually comes uh, nicely inside. And so the solid line is the exact solution. So it's no problem. This is a blast wave example. And you get the solution. And the solid line is the reference. And this is 1 over 800. This is 1 over 1,600. Uh, uh, this is the density profile uh, for the blast wave. Uh, yeah, so you get this result for using this particular treatment on the wall. So you are not using, this one. This is one dimension. You could use the symmetry to define ghost values very nicely, but we did not use that. We used the inverse last window procedure on the boundary to treat the boundary. So this is of course for test for to go into 2D, right? In 1D you don't need to use this, but if you use it, you get the results as good as the regular reflective boundary condition. Uh, in 2D, for example, Burgess equation, this is a box for which, of course, you use it only to get the those values of the first few points. But this is a disk. Uh, so this disk would be uh, not easy to compute on a rectangular grid if you do not use this inverse last window procedure. So because the boundary of the computational domain will not coincide with the grid. But with this procedure, it computes quite nicely. Uh, uh, this is probably too small. This is the third order scheme. You can see that you are getting third order accuracy. And also, you get shock problems. So this is two dimension. So we are doing a cut, I think, along the diagonal. Yeah, the cut along the diagonal direction. So you get this discontinuity. In a result in a very nice way. So the solid line is the exact solution, the circles are the numerical solutions. And same thing here. This of the previous one was the result on a box. This one was the result on a disk. So the disk you get 
similarly good results. Okay, so now let's move on to two-dimensional systems, Euler equations. First, we, we computed uh, using this procedure to see if we have accurate results. So this is a vortex problem for which we have the exact solution. You can see that for the third order scheme, you do get third order accuracy for this vortex problem. So that means the procedure is working nicely for systems. Uh, yeah. Uh, but the main the main uh, uh, advantage of this procedure is that we can compute this wall boundary conditions. In other words, for Euler equations, the wall boundary condition is that the normal velocity should be zero on the wall. <coughs> so this can be done in a very nice way. For example, this double mass refraction problem. The physical setup is that you have a ramp here. The flow comes from the left and gets refracted because you have this angle here, right? The flow gets, so you get some structure which looks like that, so it should look like that. Now, the typical way of computing this problem, there are two typical ways to compute this problem. The first one is to use a mesh which is aligned with the computational domain, but the computational domain looks strange. So either you have to use a triangle mesh or you have to do something very special. So there's uh, some corner here. The other way is to cut an artificial box, which is here, the dashed line here, artificial rectangle, this way. And then you can use regular final difference. However, then this part, this actual part with very small extension here, that's unphysical. So you have to do some boundary conditions there, which is unphysical. So either of them are not completely satisfactory. Now, if you use the last window of inverse last window procedure, then our computational match can be those dots. So they are just randomly cutting through this wall, right? So you don't have to align with the wall, so you can use just the rectangular grids. Of course, this is an illustration. The real grid is much more refined than this one. But that's the topological structure that the grids cut through the computational wall. And when we compute, we get very nice results. As a matter of fact, the results are comparable to the results computed with this thick box, the rectangular box method that we use, the fixed rectangular box, regular final difference, with the same grid resolution, we get results which are very comparable, indicating that the way that we implemented the refractive boundary condition on the boundary which is not aligned with the mesh is actually quite accurate, quite, quite nice, non-oscillatory and getting results which are comparable to a to a, to a regular uh, box. So here also you compare the two, they are comparable. Okay, so since we are, we are allowing the boundary of the physical domain not to be aligned with the point, we can allow a curved boundary, again computed by regular rectangular mesh. So here, the typical example is a circular cylinder, right? Flow past a cylinder. So this is the problem. You have a cylinder here. Flow is coming from this direction. Before including ourselves, the paper of Jiang and Xu, basically we use a body fitted mesh. We use a mesh which is, say, uh, radical in this direction and then <coughs> circular in the other direction. So we can fit a mesh to this boundary. Then you can compute using the regular refraction, but that's quite complicated. If this is not a circle, but a complicated object, then it's very difficult to do that. Now, what we could do is we just put a rectangular mesh, which cuts through this half circle in an arbitrary way. You can see this is an illustration, the actual mesh is more refined, but it cuts through this circle in a very arbitrary way. Then you implement the boundary condition using our inverse last window procedure, uh, and you get results which are quite nice. <laughs> we get this result. Delta x equals 1 over 20, delta x equals 1 over 40. The results are quite comparable with the results in Jiang and Shu or other papers for which we use a body fitted mesh. Same kind of scheme. So these references are in uh, these two papers. The first one sets down the uh, basic 
procedure and all our applications, most of the applications I have shown in this paper, Tan and Shu, in 2010 JCP. And then this paper, we have these two actual collaborators who are sort of uh, computing flames or detonation waves. And they have uh, all these complex uh, uh, geometry sitting around, and, and this is a perfect method for doing that. So they are very happy. So they had, uh, and also in this paper, we talked about this efficient implementation issue. In other words, we used the inverse last spindle procedure only for the leading term, which is the ux term, the complex. The remaining ones are treated by extrapolation. So this one, then, uh, three times, leading to go to fifth order or any order. <laughs> so it went to fifth order to compute this, and we get very good results. So these two guys are very satisfied with the results. OK. And you can now, another advantage of this business is that now you can use this to solve problems for which you have a moving body in the flow. So for example, it's a ball moving in the fluid. For this, usually you could, of course, let them uh, build a computational mesh which also moves with the ball, but that's complicated. So if you have a fixed mesh, a moving object, then the boundary of the object, of course, cuts through the grades in an arbitrary fashion. But the inverse last window procedure is quite easy to do for this, pro for this problem. The only difference is that before I had a time derivative and a spatial derivative, I replace the spatial derivative by time derivative using the PDE, using the boundary condition and the PDE. Now, I should replace the spatial derivative by the so-called material derivative, which is the time derivative along the moving line, right? The so-called capital D dt. So that's the only difference. Otherwise, you design the inverse last venture procedure exactly the same way. Then you can treat the boundary condition of a moving object. So this is quite nice. And this you can compare this with the very famous method, very popular method of inverse the boundary method. There are some similarities. Basically, we treat the boundary, uh, uh, the inverse the boundary method is also treating uh, the moving object with a fixed mesh. Uh, however, usually the inverse boundary uh, method puts in some artificial stiff term around the boundary, some data function type things around the boundary. This stiffness would affect the uh, performance of the numerical solution somewhat. For example, stiffness could reduce the, the time step, it could increase the solver condition number, and so on. And also, uh, the uh, the accuracy, all of accuracy of inverse boundary condition usually are limited to at most two, usually first order, sometimes second order. Uh, in this particular procedure, we do not introduce any stiffness into the problem. I think the main difference is that we utilize the PDE more extensively than inverse boundary. Because here we repeatedly use the PDE, where right? take the derivative, take the second derivative, the third derivative, taking the PDE, taking the derivative of the PDE, the second derivative of the PDE, and so on. Once you use PDE a lot, you are incorporating a lot of more physics, I think, into your algorithm, because the PDE is the physics, right? So you're incorporating more physics into the problem, which releases some of the stiffness. So our problem is not stiff at all. So near the boundary, there's no stiffness that we have observed. Accuracy can be actually very high order. So this should compare with, so all those numbers, but this should compare nicely with the boundary. So this could be a very useful tool in computing uh, moving objects. Of course, our eventual goal would be fluid structure interaction, but we are very far from there. So here, there's no structure. So the ball is a solid ball, it's just moving in the fluid. But we can already compute, so this is the one-dimensional case, a cylinder is moving in the fluid it's, uh, with this uh, given speed. Uh, uh, then you compute, you get, uh, first of all, fifth order accuracy. You also get very nice performance in this, uh, so this is the cylinder. You get basically no artifacts in this very uh, good uh, short tube problem solution. 
Usually, other methods could have some difficulties very near. The, yeah, the fuel point is very near this moving cylinder, but here you can see that it's quite clean, so there's nothing artificial happening when the cylinder is moving from left to right. So this is very nice. This is two dimension. You also get the accuracy. This is still the third order days, so the accuracy is third order. Uh, and this is the third order. And finally, this is the problem for which a ball is moving, so there's a shock and a cylinder, which is a two-dimensional ball, like a circle. So a shock is moving into this cylinder, pushes this cylinder, so the cylinder goes floating in the fluid. And at a certain time, the location of the cylinder <coughs> seems to be converged with great refinement, and also these numbers you can compare with literature data that other people have computed and so on. So we are comparing with these people and we are getting quite good results. And so this is how it looks like. So there's a shock here, there's a ball here. Shock hits the ball, generates all this complex structure. At the same time, the ball goes moves up and down, up and down, hit the ball, hit the top and bounce back. So all kinds of crazy things. And the code can compute it nicely. So the ball now moves to this location already. Uh, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, very happily that the code can compute this kind of moving uh, objects. Okay, so these uh, results for moving objects are contained in these two papers. There's a JCP paper in 2011 with 10 again, and also there's a, a conference a proceeding paper uh, in which we have some surveys but also new results for this uh, moving uh, objects problem. That just came out. Okay, so the concluding remarks for this inverse last window procedure. I would say this procedure actually has a very good potential. We are still working on it, so right now we are trying to get this procedure to work for uh, complex schemes, for other things, for even for DG, uh, for other uh, problems, for Navier Stokes equations. So we are pushing it in all fronts. We think it carries a good potential because it's a simple procedure and it allows you to treat complex problems using simple methods. Uh, so uh, uh, here I said that generalization to other schemes such as DG scheme viscous problems with deformable structures, so this would be the fluid structure interaction. So we are trying uh, to push all these fronts. Uh, I don't think I want to continue. We are a little bit over time already. So the remaining applications, I would keep. Uh, I mean, the the the, the transparent the, the PDF files are here, so you can maybe post it somewhere. And if you are interested, you can read them. Also, the papers are available on my website. Most of the papers which are not published are available as PDF files on my website. Those who are published, I I. I used to put them on the website, but they are copyright issues. So right now, those who have papers which have already appeared in journals, only the titles are there. But if you want PDF files, you can send me an email, uh, and I can send the PDF file to you. That is okay, but posting it there sometimes is a problem. <laughs> it's a journal version. Uh, yeah, so if you have any uh, 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 interest in these uh, remaining topics, you can read these papers, write emails to me if you want. Okay. With that, I will stop here, take questions. Questions? Anyone have questions? Uh, you have said that um, uh, finite volume method can work with uh, non-uniform meshes. Yes. Uh, and uh, what is the best way to work with such meshes? To, to work with non-uniform, with oh. strong non-uniform meshes. Strong non-uniform, you mean uh, finite volume scheme automatically can do uh, any kind of rectangular mesh. So that the procedure is identical to uniform mesh, rectangular mesh. So it's a subroutine is identical to, well, not identical, but very similar computational causes. Yeah, so people, people compute flows or planes, so the measures are not rectangular. You can use 
use this inverse last method. <laughs> but um, if I understand uh, properly, the uh, coefficients in uh, Vino procedure will be uh, not, not the same. In the linear weights, right, right? The linear weights would depend on the, on the, uh, yeah, on the, the relative mesh size. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So there are some. Yeah, I shouldn't say it's the same. So there are some complications. Yeah. Yes, okay. yeah. Thanks. Yeah. More questions? I have a question on inverse Latvinov procedure. When when you have second order derivative, it means you write. Uh, your time derivative will be connected to both first and second order spatial derivative. How are you going to get uh, spatial derivative? Then? Because now you have your t equal to minus u x, and then you get u x from here. Right. But if you have u uh, t equal to u x plus u x x, then okay. The so that's the first stop. That's my bullet. Uh, well, that's my bullet uh, in the previous page. But is it resolvable? I mean, do you do you or do you already have an answer, or you are only thinking about an answer? We are. We already have an answer. So first of all, this is actually not a trivial answer. Okay. For example, if it is u t equals to u x x heat equation, yeah. then you cannot do it oh, yeah. because you cannot get u x right. You can yeah. you can get u x x, yeah. but you cannot get u x. But it's not difficult to understand why the heat equation. You see, this procedure relies on the fact that it is hyperbolic. So if you are sitting here, when you cross the boundary, you get influenced only by the boundary value yeah. here. You are not influenced by the, the far away guy. Mm -hmm. If it is a Healy equation, you are from 0 to 1, right? You are given boundary condition on 0 and at 1. If you are very close to 0, you, still, you are still influenced, influenced by the boundary condition at 1. Right, so it's a more global. So this procedure works only for convection-dominated convection diffusion equation. In other words, it's a high Reynolds number. So this procedure, there's a switch, there's something in there that when you should use this procedure. So we have worked out a, a, a process that can do never stops. And for just pure convection, for example, if I solve all the equations effectively mm -hmm. in the boundary, I only need pressure because the rest will be zero. But for the pressure, pressure is computed from the solution. So do I, am I supposed to differentiate backward in time? Say this GT function at the boundary, say pressure. Right. Right. It's not given, we just the backward. I can have a table going backward in time. Well, if it from is... From the previous time step. Yeah, no, if it is, uh, uh, if it's an inflow, let's say if it is a... Uh, solid ball, if it is solid, solid ball. Solid ball, okay. Solid ball, the only thing you know is u equals zero. Yeah, but for the numerical flux, I need pressure. No, I, 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 I only needed the information. For this, if we, we have some, uh, we worked out some formulas there. Uh, so <coughs> you should read the details in the paper. But I don't need the pressure. I mean, what I mean is, in the numerical flux, normal velocity is zero, and the only remaining non zero term is actually the pressure. Just but you can, yeah, but you still need to use strongly the fact that u is zero there, and the PDE. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. You don't, you don't extrapolate the pressure as you said. Yeah. That wouldn't work. That, that, that's that wouldn't pressure. work, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, you are trying to do a roundabout way to get the correct value of yeah, you don't actually play the pressure directly from backward time. Yeah, you um, don't do that. Uh, this, this, this that's point. unstable. I don't think that's okay, stable. If I, if I have a linear equation, for example, something like say, kinetic equation, then yeah. and the boundary condition is a function, say, of density, and density right. is integral. Right. But then I only have backward uh, values in time. So there I would probably have to differentiate Time. The integral in terms of t or in terms, in terms of, of velocity. Okay, this is maybe velocity. okay. Maybe we're going too far. Yeah, yeah, too, too far. You ask me in private. Way. Yeah, on the train back. Yes. <laughs> Other questions? Okay. So we can then uh, say thank you, and then we shall continue tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you.